Hello everyone. Today in dermatology lectures, we are going to discuss one of the blistering diseases that is pamphigus. The main types of pamphigus that is pamphigus vulgaris and pamphigus foliaceus. And furthermore, we will also discuss other types of pamphigus. Please subscribe to my channel. If you're watching my video for the first time, don't forget to like, subscribe and click the bell icon for the notifications. The word pamphigus is derived from the Greek word pamphix, meaning blister or bubble. It is a group of an autoimmune intraepidermal blistering diseases of the skin and the mucous membranes. Every blistering disease has an antigen that is targeted by an antibody. The normal epithelial cell to cell adhesion of the keratinocytes is lost because of the presence of circulating IgG autoantibodies acting against the cadherin type of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion molecules in the desmosomes, that is desmoglenes. Cadherin is a single transmembrane protein with unique structure. Because of the loss of normal cell-to-cell -cell adhesion of the keratinocytes, leading to acantholysis, causing blister formation, and followed by the finding of IgG deposition on the surface of keratinocytes in patient's skin. Based on the level of blister formation, clinical and histopathological features, pamphigus is classified into pamphigus vulgaris. Pamphigus vegetan is a variant of pamphigus vulgaris. Superficial pamphigus are further classified as pamphigus foliaceus, pamphigus erythematosus, and fogo salvagium. Other types include herpetiform pamphigus, drug-induced pamphigus, paraneoplastic pamphigus, and IgA pamphigus. First of all, we will discuss pamphigus vulgaris. Pamphigus vulgaris affects people of all races, age, and sex. Most commonly, it appears between the ages of 30 and 60 years and is particularly common in Jews and people of Mediterranean or Indian origin than in other races, most likely because of genetic reasons. Pemphigus vulgaris is an autoimmune blistering disease of skin and mucous membranes. The keratinocytes are cemented together by desmosome, a certain type of proteins linked together by filaments. The desmosomal cadherin family is a major structural unit of the desmosome. It is composed of desmoglenes and desmocolins. Desmoglenes and desmocolins are glycoproteins containing a single transmembrane domain through which they interact extracellularly, contributing to intercellular adhesions. Intracellularly, the cadherins bind to placoglobin, placophilin, and indirectly to desmoplakin, forming the desmosomal plaque. The desmosomal plaque interacts with the keratin intermediate filaments. In pamphigus vulgaris IgG immunoglobulin type G, autoantibodies bind to a protein called desmoglin 3 which is found in desmosomes in the keratinocytes near the bottom of the epidermis. That causes a separation between the keratinocytes from each other, leading to tombstone appearance and are replaced by fluid forming the blisters. About 50% of the patients with pamphigus vulgaris also have anti-desmoglin 1 antibodies. According to the extent of cutaneous lesions, pamphigus vulgaris is further divided into cutaneous type and mucocutaneous types. These subtypes of pamphigus vulgaris have distinct histopathologic and serologic findings. The desmoglene compensation theory shows that these subtypes are formed because anti-desmoglein 3 IgG becomes pathologically weak in the presence of potent anti-desmoglein 1 IgG autoantibodies. In cutaneous type PV, patients have predominant anti-desmoglein 1 IgG autoantibodies as well as anti-desmoglein 3 IgG autoantibodies clinically shows blisters and erosions in the skin only without mucosal involvement. Histologic examination of the cutaneous lesions demonstrates suprabasilar acantholysis a typical finding of pamphigus vulgaris. In mucocutaneous type of pamphigus vulgaris, as the sera contain both anti-desmoglein 1 
and anti-desmoglein 3 IgG, the functions of both desmogleins is compromised and blisters occur in both the skin and mucous membranes. Now we will discuss clinical features of Pamphicus vulgaris. Skin lesions in Pamphicus vulgaris appear as thin walled flaccid blisters filled with clear fluid that easily rupture causing itching and painful erosions. They most often arise on the upper chest, back, scalp and face. Most patients with Pamphicus vulgaris first present with lesions on the mucous membranes such as the mouth and genitals. Blisters usually develop on the skin after few weeks or months. Although in some cases, mucosal lesions may be the only manifestation of the disease. The mucosal dominant Pamphicus vulgaris type presents with mucosal involvement with less skin erosions. Mucocutaneous type Pamphicus vulgaris presents with extensive skin blisters and erosions with the mucosal involvement. The inside of the mouth is commonly involved in Pamphigus vulgaris. Involvement of the pharynx and larynx cause pain on swallowing and hoarseness of voice. Nasal involvement causes congestion and bleeding. The conjunctiva, esophagus, labia, vagina, cervix, penis, urethra and anus may also be affected. In Pamphigus vagitans, which is the variant of Pamphigus vulgaris, the flaccid blisters that become erosions in the interterrigenous areas and on the scalp or face may develop into vegetative lesions, which then form fungoid vegetations or papillomatous proliferations and are granular and crusted. The lesions heal with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. The skin around the nails may be painful, red, and swollen. And here you can see thin walled flaccid blisters on the back of the patient and other mucosal involvement. And here you can see the vegetative regions on the back of the neck of the patient in Pamphigus vagitans. As the erosions caused by Pamphigus vulgaris can be life-threatening and extensive, it is very important to timely diagnose Pamphigus vulgaris. Pamphigus vulgaris can be fatal because a large portion of a skin loses its epidermal barrier function, leading to the loss of body fluids or to other bacterial infections. Other potentially severe complications may include secondary bacterial infections, fungal infections, mainly candida, viral infections mostly, herpes simplex. As there is difficulty in eating food and patient cannot eat properly, leading to nutritional deficiencies. Complications of immunosuppressive treatments and systemic corticosteroids, especially infections and osteoporosis can be present. The psychological effects of severe skin disease and its treatment leads to anxiety and depression. The diagnosis of Pamphigus vulgaris generally requires a biopsy from the skin adjacent to the lesion, as you can see the arrow in this picture. Histology of the early lesions of the Pamphigus vulgaris shows suprabasal epidermal acantholysis, intraepidermal clafting, and blister formation just above the basal layer of the epidermis. The blister cavity may contain inflammatory cells, including eosinophils and rounded acantholytic cells with intensely eosinophilic cytoplasm and a perinuclear halo. The floor of the blister may be lined with intact keratinocytes, showing a tombstone pattern. Dermal changes include perivascular inflammatory infiltrate, particularly with eosinophils. Pamphigus is confirmed by direct immunofluorescent staining of the perilational skin biopsy sections to reveal immunoglobulin IgG autoantibodies or complement on the cell surfaces of the keratinocytes. In Pamphigus vulgaris, binding of the pathologic IgG is demonstrated using fluorescein labeled anti IgG probes, producing a fishnet pattern of staining. 
In most cases, circulating antibodies can be detected by a blood test, that is, indirect immunofluorescence test. Indirect immunofluorescence or secondary immunofluorescence is a technique used in the laboratories to detect circulating autoantibodies in the patient's serum. The level of autoantibodies fluctuates and may reflect the effectiveness of the treatment. Specific antidesmoglein 1 and antidesmoglein 3 antibody titers can also be measured in blood or saliva by enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. The primary aim of the treatment of Famphigus vulgaris is to decrease blister formation, prevent infections, and promote healing of the blisters and erosions. Systemic corticosteroids are the mainstay of the medical treatment for controlling the disease, usually in the form of moderate to high doses of oral prednisolone or as pulsed intravenous methylprednisolone. Since their use, Many deaths from Pamphigus vulgaris has been prevented, and the mortality rate has dropped from 99% to 5 to 15%. Corticosteroids are not a cure for the disease, but improve the patient's quality of life by reducing disease activity. The doses of corticosteroids needed to control Pamphigus vulgaris and the length of the time on the treatment may result in serious side effects and risks. Other immunosuppressive drugs are used off-label to reduce the dose of steroids and may be required by patients with Pamphigus vulgaris for years. These are most often azathioprine, mycophenolate morphetil, cyclophosphamide, rituximab. It is now approved for the primary treatment of Pamphigus vulgaris by FDA. Other medications that are sometimes used in Pamphigus often in combination include Dapson, Methotrexate, Tetracyclines, Nicotinamide, Plasmaphoresis, Intravenous Immunoglobulin, Extracorporeal Photophoresis, Immunoadsorption, Infliximab, the TNF-alpha inhibitor. At optimal therapy, patients may continue to experience mild disease activity. Other considerations include vaccination. Live vaccines are contraindicated. Baseline ophthalmological assessment and psychological support if needed. Topical therapy for cutaneous pamphigus may include topical steroids and emollients. Treatment of mucosal pamphigus vulgaris may include various formulations of topical steroid, intralesional steroid, topical tacrolimus, or topical cyclosporin. Appropriate wound care is particularly important as this should promote healing of the blisters and erosions. Handle skin very gently to avoid causing new blisters and erosions. Wear surgical gloves and use aseptic technique when changing dressings. Analgesics may be needed especially for dressing changes. Gently cleans with an antiseptic solution or take a bleach bath. Drain intact blisters, but leave the blister roof intact. Apply a bland emollient ointment, such as 50% white soft paraffin plus 50% liquid paraffin directly to the skin or apply the, or apply the ointment to a dressing. Use non-adherent dressings such as petroleum soaked gauze or silicone mesh. An, absorb an absorbent dressing may be applied over the primed dressing if the erosions are oozing. Identifying and treating any infections. Patients should minimize activities and may traumatize the skin and mucous membrane during active phases of the disease. This include activities such as contact sports and eating or drinking food that may irritate or damage the inside of the mouth, that is spicy, acidic, hard, and crunchy foods. Oral hygiene and proper dental care are essential. Use a soft toothbrush and mint-free toothpaste to gently and thoroughly brush teeth twice daily. Rinse using an antiseptic or inflammatory mouthwash. Treat oral candidiasis if present. Thank you for watching the first part of Pamphigus. In the next one, we will discuss Pamphigus fallacious and other types of Pamphigus, as it was very difficult to compile all these in one lecture.
so stay tuned and don't forget to like subscribe and click the bell icon for the notifications keep watching skin doctor for you